Because I'm a fake fan, I didn't know that 2019 marked the 100th anniversary of Korean cinema. Really, my knowledge of the Korean film industry begins at the same time that the West in general took notice, the late 1990s. Though it's been 100 years since the first movie, it's been just 20 since the first real Hollywood-type blockbuster, Kang jae Gyu's Shiri. That film came during a new wave that would bring the country to international acclaim, particularly from the likes of newcomers Bong Joon-ho and Park Chan-wook, both of whom released their debut features in this early period. And to celebrate all of that, Film at Lincoln Center in New York City is doing a retrospective of classic films from this early period now through December 4th, showcasing 21 films released between 1996 and 2003. While they couldn't get the rights to Shiri, there are some truly incredible films in the lineup and also a Hong Song Soo movie. I mean, they've got everything from the early works of Kim Ji Woon and Bong Joon Ho to comedy classics like Attack the Gas Station and My Sassy Girl. There are three Park Chan Wook movies, including Old Boy, which is excellent, but also possibly the least exciting entry other than that Hong Song Soo movie. Look, I just don't enjoy Hong Sung Soo movies very much. I once got into a bit of a back and forth with High Life director Claire Denis about this, which was super awkward. And afterwards, she asked the PR guy who set up the interview if I was okay. So that was a lot. Because everyone knows Old Boy. It was so many people's introduction to Korean cinema, mine included. But that year, 2003, saw another release that deserved far more recognition than it got. One of the wildest films I have ever seen, an incredible mashup of styles and tones that results in something utterly unique. A movie that feels like it could not have been made anywhere else during any other time. And Lincoln Center is showing that one too. Hello, by the way, and welcome to the Week I Review. You can call me a true non-believer. And today, I am talking about Jung Jun Hwan's debut feature, Save the Green Planet. Seeing the film back in 2003 was Midsummer director Ari Aster's first experience with Korean cinema. I know this because he introduced last Friday's screening at the Walter Reed Theater. I had actually known he was a fan of Save the Green Planet because he had listed it as an inspiration for Midsummer in discussion with IndieWire, but it was a pleasant surprise to see him in the audience watching this 4K restoration with a whole bunch of plebeians. His introduction was short and sweet, saying, you stuff as much movie as you can without it breaking, and somehow this one doesn't break. Save the Green Planet follows Lee Byung-gu, played by sympathy for Mr. Vengeance's Shin ha Gyun, a man convinced that aliens have invaded from the planet Andromeda and must be stopped. He fixates on one Kang Man Shik, the head of a chemical production company, convinced that he is of royal Andromeda lineage and concerned about what he is going to do during the lunar eclipse, which is just days away. So Lee kidnaps Kong with the help of childlike hanger on Sunni and brings him to a basement dungeon for information extraction, i.e., torture. And the film goes between the home where Kong tries to escape and out in the world as the police try to find this very important person who has suddenly disappeared. If you're hearing shades of misery in any of that, you're not wrong. Zhang Jun Huan saw and enjoyed the 1990 adaptation of Stephen King's novel, but he was bothered by the depiction of Annie as merely a crazy person. He wanted to take the idea and flip it on its head, telling that story from the perspective of kidnapper rather than kidnappee. He later came across a website convinced that Leonardo DiCaprio was an alien looking to conquer the planet by seducing all of its women and saw an opportunity to smash these ideas together. And Save the Green Planet is all about smashing ideas together. There is no way to distill its experience into any simple descriptor. You can't even classify its genre because it's 
damn near every one. It's comedy-ish, drama-ish, horror for sure, and at least sci-fi adjacent. It's got bonkers animation and police procedural stuff involving fate and coin flips and even a brief moment of wire work kung fu. If you want it, this movie has got it. And somehow it works. The transitions from one part of this bizarre patchwork to another aren't always seamless, but the jarring nature actually serves the narrative, because you're never sure what's going on or what is real. Critically, you don't know Lee's true motivations. Clearly, the man suffers from some kind of mental illness that causes hallucinations, and that he takes prescription meth to handle. And Kong's company appears to be the reason that Lee's mother is in the hospital in a vegetative state, giving him a reason to kidnap and torture this man beyond any kind of delusion that he may be suffering from. This tension is the film's driving force. Because you want to believe Lee, if for no other reason than he is the protagonist. Also, Kong is a trash person. The first time we see him, he is drunk and stiffs a driver on his fare, and then threatens the poor guy when he tries to get what he's owed. I mean, is that enough to enjoy a person's crucifixion? Maybe. Oh yeah, Kong gets crucified sort of, and it leads to easily the most disturbing image in the entire film, and one on par, I think, with the cut Achilles tendons and sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, which make me shudder every damn time I see it, and I imagine will be even more horrible when I see it on the big screen during this retrospective. But that brings us to the point in this review where I need to talk openly about how Save the Green Planet ends, because you cannot discuss this movie without talking about that ending. I think it's one of the all-time greats. Ready? The decision to validate Lee's rantings is probably my favorite final turn in any movie ever. It is a perfect twist that isn't actually a twist at all. The protagonist of this film, now dead at the hands of the monster he tried to save humanity from, had been saying for two hours that this is who and what Kong was. From the opening moments of the film, we had been told that he was Andromeda royalty. The surprise is outside the narrative. You don't believe Lee because you know he is delusional, and because the things he is saying are so beyond comprehension. Kong doesn't seem quite normal. His multi-minute urination is, shall we say, odd. So is the fact that he survives the high voltages that Lee tells us regular human cannot. But are we to trust a madman? You get caught up in Occam's razor, convinced that the simplest answer is the correct one. Kong is a bad person, but innocent of the charges being levied against him. I mean, this is a Korean thriller. People getting undeservedly tortured is basically the free spot on that bingo card. And no matter how weirdly stylized this movie is, it's not that weird, right? But of course it is. And the reveal is just so inspired, coming as it does in two parts with one last curveball in between. The way the alternate history mixes imagery from the real world, the Bible, and 2001 A Space Odyssey to tell the story of how humanity came to be under the watch of these aliens is mind-blowing. And you think, whoa, Lee was right. But it's so out there that when Lee realizes that all of his books detailing said history are strewn around the room, you breathe a slight sigh of relief. No. No, it's the thing you thought it was. And you continue to think that until fucking alien lasers rain down from the heavens. I remember my shock the first time I saw that, the final confirmation that Lee was right the whole time, and that this was actually a sci-fi movie. My jaw dropped, and I laughed for four straight minutes. In the theater, I got to soak in the gasps and at least one, no way, of the unexpectedly large 9 p.m. audience. What makes the whole thing even wilder is how bad the visual effects are, particularly now that the cleaned up 4K restoration doesn't hide things the way the low quality DVD transfer I was used to did. Everything practical looks fantastic, and so the already bad for 2003 CGI is much more apparently awful. You can't not notice it, 
But there's something kind of endearing about these early attempts to use a technology that was nowhere near ready, you know? The man audacious enough to do this ending wasn't going to be stopped by some weak sauce render farms. And good, because there is no other satisfying way to conclude that story than with a final genre turn and the literal destruction of the planet by aliens with hilariously large earlobes. Because the people in the movie are just like us. They do everything in their power to disbelieve Lee. They write off what he says, and we all learn the truth when it's too late. But as the audience, that's wonderful. Because the most shocking thing of all is something I've said before, that it works. Honestly, it is unfathomable that any person could pull off this particular pastiche, and yet it was done. And in Zhang Jun Huan's debut, no less. It seemed to announce the presence of a truly vital new voice, one even more wildly experimental than his better-known contemporaries. But it would be 10 years before Zhang would make another film. 2013's Hua Yi is good. A thoroughly Korean, which is to say extremely bleak, action thriller about a young man who has visions of a monster attacking him, realizing that the various murderous men he calls father kidnapped him when he was a child. Sure, slightly out there premise, but the monster doesn't pay off in any unique way, and in general, the only indication you have that this is the same man who made Save the Green Planet is the name in the credits. It's good. But even that is disappointing. His next film, 1987, When the Day Comes, is a better movie, but even less unique. A based-on-a-true-story political thriller about the killing of a protester by the police and the subsequent attempts at a cover-up. Both are worth seeing, but it's clear that the lightning Zhang captured in the early 2000s has been lost. And that's a damn shame. But at least we still have the bottle it was captured in. 9.0 out of 10. Thank you so much for watching, and thank you particularly to my patrons, my mom, Hamry and Marco, Kat Zaracata, Benjamin Schiff, Anthony Cole, at Blasian FMA, at Magnolia Denton. If you like this video, that's great. If not, I'm sorry. If you want to see more, please subscribe. I hope to see you next week.